Good afternoon, everybody. This is Kiro Riri Paddle, and today we are sitting down with Kersha Wright. Hello, everybody. How are you, Kersha? I'm good, you know, doing good. I have my water here, staying hydrated. So, nice. you always <laughs> got to go with water, right? You have to, you always have to. <laughs> Uh, Kurt Shai is an artist from Toronto, and not only is she multi-talented, but she is such a kind and gentle soul. Uh, I will offer a little bit of disclosure. I ran into Kersha a few years back as we crossed paths, and ever since then, she's always been someone I consider to be just a, a really cool and awesome person, and I'm hoping that I can show you guys how cool she is. But enough of me talking, please, Kersha. Introduce yourself. What an amazing introduction. Wow, I am honored. Okay, absolutely. Um, yeah, so it was really great, you know, running into you as well, because you're also somebody, usually when I work jobs that are not art related, um, I feel very, very alone, very secluded, because I'm just like a receptionist at a company that doesn't have anything to do with art, right? But I think you're one of those people where I was working with them, and I'm just like, thank God. Like someone who's like... <laughs> not boring to talk to like someone's actually interesting so then when we saw each other again um like a few years ago in Kensington I was like oh I hope you're like how are you doing you're doing well and like you kind of like gave gave me that same positivity that I was used to receiving back when I was working and I was like at that time I was super like bummed not to make it so like um uh, so uh, what's the word uh so drastic I don't know I can't find the word right now but yeah I was like not in a good place I remember like people like that at work where I was just like oh yeah this is I could feel like safe here or like actually have fun because it was a really boring job um it was it was super boring super boring and like too much responsibility for like not enough pay but whatever that's a whole different, different tell me drama. about it yeah <laughs> um but yeah that was it was kind of like a weird moment for me because around that time I was transitioning into uh, taking art a little bit more serious. I did study um, and received a BFA at OK University. So I was, you know, pretty motivated to make art. But at that time, I was kind of like, OK, is it actually worth it? Am I actually going to make money from it? I don't know what I'm doing, essentially. Um, but that year I received grants to make artwork. So I was able to rent a space. I was able to work on a full, you know, series of artwork. So it was a, a really important shift for me within my practice. Um, and ever since then, I've just been continuing um, making art in my studio, as well as working, um, doing workshops, like community-based workshops around the city, also teaching um, and doing mural work, which I do primarily in the summer when it's nice and hot or spring, fall. When it's just not snowing, that's what I'm doing in real work. Um, so yeah, I basically started taking things a little bit more seriously around like 2017, 2018. And ever since then, I've been working as a self-employed artist. Nice. Amazing. Uh, yeah, it, it seems that a lot of artists, especially in today's day and age, go through a, uh, a similar sort of trajectory where even if they're educated in the arts, their first job or their first like career, or whatever, uh, post-grad isn't necessarily in the arts and they yeah. go through a little bit of like a crisis thing. I, I don't claim to be an artist on your level or having your, your sort of education, but I did do a little bit of art and music and stuff when I was younger. So when I thought I could make a career out of it, I, but I was looking at like, maybe I should do a stable nine to five. I kind of had a, a similar sort of like crisis. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I, I think that's also something that everyone has to kind of encounter at some point, right? Like, just like, is this something you really are able to commit to? Do you truly want it? If you want it, you'll fight for it, you'll go for it. And I'm happy to see that you fought for it. Oh yeah, I like, I couldn't do anything else. I would be like, some days I'd be like, maybe I should get into something more practical and like, nah, nah, nah. Like I would be miserable there. So um, yeah, it's just something that I've always knew I wanted to do. And I think COVID has challenged a lot of artists in the sense where now we're really having time to self-reflect and be like, okay, so why am I making art? Like there's no physical shows anymore. So it's super hard to get shows. Like all of 2020, my CV is blank because I didn't do any 
gallery shows because people couldn't, you know, mingle in groups. Right. So now I'm just kind of thinking like, why do I make art? What is its message? What is its purpose? Because there's no space for it anymore. I think a lot of artists are questioning that very notion. And I think it's kind of like a, it's like a, uh, something that is felt collectively, like as a community of artists. Um, so right now I'm just like, I'm doing a lot more thinking on that aspect because my art, I make it because it makes me feel happy. and It doesn't always necessarily have any sort of deep meaning half the time. I'm just making it for the sheer joy of it, which I feel like is really important to do. Um, but I think right now I'm like looking a little bit inward and trying to think about like actually why. So I'm at a, like another stage in my practice, which has been, you know, sped up by COVID-19. I see. Yeah. It's, um, <laughs> it's interesting how COVID has affected so many of us in so many different different yet similar ways. Mm -hmm. But um, you've told us a little bit about yourself and what you're currently going through and what has brought you to this point. Do you think you can uh, backtrack a little bit and tell us what started your interest in the art world and what would you define your styles of art as? Um, I would define my style of art as like surrealist, abstract, figurative work. Um, I'm trying to build these environments that are based on reality, but are, you know, kind of in this realm of fantasy, if that makes sense. So I think my artwork is more so defined with surrealism nowadays. Um, what created my interest in the art world was, uh, I've always loved making art. So it was just like, naturally, I was uh, interested in that world. But my introduction came through street art. Um, I used to read this magazine, which has been, it's not discontinued, but it only runs like biannually now called Juxtapose magazine. So I used to read those obsessively in high school. Um, so that's what really started my love for it. It wasn't really fine art space. Like I wasn't really studying Renaissance based artists or anything like that. I was just really into people who, you know, did work illegally or did really large scale, like really out there mural work. So that was my introduction into that whole art world sphere. I see. I see. Would you say that there were any other styles of art or expression that influenced you in your earlier stages? So whether it was acting or was it certain styles or genres of different artwork that weren't surrealism? Um, I, <laughs> I wanted to be a comedian like very when I was really young because I just really like making people laugh to this day. Just like I think it's like that middle child syndrome where you just like want people to be happy around you at all times. So I've always wanted to like, or when I was a kid, I wanted to be a comedian and like want to do acting for a bit, but you know, I'm too shy. So I never, I never even took drama cause I was so, so socially awkward and shy. Um, but I think I've always been interested in music um, as, you know, someone who consumes it, but also someone who has attempted um, to make music um, a couple of years ago, I tried to rap under a pseudonym. I will not, you know, expose what that was, but it was just like a time in my life where I felt like that was the only way to get out certain emotions, not in a serious level. Like it was all jokes. It was all for fun, but it really helped me like, I don't know, get through things. Um, and I, I'm really inspired by film and, um, animation as well like I love anime um, a few years back I watched Akira it changed my life I named my cat Tetsuo like I was in it um, <laughs> awesome <laughs> yeah it's like a, that movie in particular really changed the way I saw um, art as well like the backdrops in that film are so beautiful and uh, those action sequences as well like when Tetsuo is uh, expanding into that uh disgusting figure like those scenes to me like were super inspiring for me um so yeah it's like a mix of everything like I'm really inspired by pop culture like more so than the history of art like I'm inspired by pop culture and kind of these like subculture movements more so 
I, I will say I also love anime. I grew up with anime. Uh, to me, mm-hmm. uh, it was like, I think that was like my first discernible style of like animation that I knew about because like my, my uncle was very much into it. And I saw Akira when I was young, probably not a, a good movie to see when you're like four or five. But, no. <laughs> but, uh, but I, I understand exactly what you mean. Um, like anime has inspired me in a lot of the things that I do as well. And it's it's also interesting to hear you say that you were expressing yourself under a pseudonym for music. I I love the fact that music is so accessible. Like you can go and buy an interface and a mic from anywhere, and you can just put your music up online. And mm-hmm. it, it, it's good because I I do remember a time when it was hard for anyone to really get into music and you had to go to a studio and there was a lot of gatekeeping involved with you just putting out your demo. But now there are people who are releasing like award-worthy music or even just music to help express themselves and just to get themselves through a tough time. And it's great to hear that you as an artist, uh, you're able to find different avenues and ways to express yourself when you Mm -hmm. can find yourself able to do it through your regular medium. Yeah, um, I was discussing this recently too. Like, I recognize that little M box because my partner was looking for one for the longest time. He's like, I need to find an M box so I can record at home. Da, da, da. And like, the quality that you get from these pieces of machinery that you can get on Amazon or what have you is so amazing. And if you get plugins as well that you're using on your interface, like, you can make some really quality stuff at home, which is revolutionized art the way we see it and the way we've like been able to disperse it and I've been finding a lot of musicians who are established who do have record labels etc releasing their own like uh like beat tapes or uh small like EPs for the internet during this time like quarantine jams or what have you and releasing a lot of video as well like I've been loving seeing the back hand to it if that makes sense like the what goes behind the scenes into making these uh, either EPs or artworks, what have you. Like, I think it has shown the versatility in the arts and how like you can, you can do things from your bedroom essentially. And I love it. I I want more of it. I, I can't wait for all of this lockdown stuff to end because I want to see the performance side of it as well. Yes. I cannot wait. Like, not only do I miss shows, I'm sure you know we all miss shows and going out and interacting with humans. But I can't mm-hmm. wait to see these new artists who were probably working in finance before or marketing or jobs that maybe they weren't truly content with. But now that they have found the means to express themselves, that they'll be able to bring it to others and share their story and share their craft. Yeah, exactly. And I'm seeing. I've been seeing um, like very accessible. Uh, websites that are that were created for you know the everyday person to learn a new skill like Skillshare if you if only you were sponsored by Skillshare this would be the time to plug it but you know it's been (laughs) (laughs) it's been a great opportunity for people who didn't really explore that avenue in life to just do it like right now and they're discovering like oh I'm like a pretty good beat maker or oh you know, I'm a pretty good painter. And that's something they wouldn't have done regardless because they were always outside trying to, you know, run errands or go to work and stuff. I think that's like a beautiful thing that's come out of it. And I'm also like really excited to see like live shows after all of this, because a lot of musicians and and artists who have just been cooking up so much in this time, like when it's time to perform and when it's time for the shows to um, be up, like it's just going to be, it's going to be insane. It's going to be lovely. I can't wait for it, especially in a city like ours. It's mm-hmm. going to be so vibrant. It, it really is going to be the Roaring Twenties, as everyone says. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, uh, just before we move on, you mentioned comedy. Yeah. How, you are funny. <laughs> you're, you're, you're pretty funny. I, I, I can say that um, uh, a lot of the times that we were working with each other, you would like have these like little sly remarks, or you'd, yeah. you'd do something or say something in the lunchroom, and I was like, "Wow, wow, that Kersha, Kersha's funny. That that was a good delivery." Uh, <laughs> I love comedy, but I the thing I love the most about comedy is when people um, that aren't comedians do funny things because it's so pure and honest, 
And mm-hmm. I feel like that's a big part of your personality too, is that you, you have like this joy and this like humor that comes out that kind of catches people off guard, but it's very inviting as well. Yeah, I'm glad that you appreciate my humor. <laughs> I've met people that like, I, when I, especially when I'm, I first meet someone, it's, it's like I'm trying so hard to make them laugh to see like an inkling to their, their personality. So if I can't make someone laugh, I panic. Like I go into full panic mode and I, I try so hard to make them laugh. Like I'm just like, you know, throwing all these jokes at them. And if nothing's sticking, like I immediately shut down. Like, I don't know what to do. If I can't make someone laugh in that way, like I don't know how to communicate with them. I'm just like, it's, it's done. (laughs) <laughs> I, I feel you on that but i also i think anyone who can't find like humor or like can't laugh to something they're they're not human like they're, yeah. they're robots <laughs> basically yeah that's what i'm saying i'm funny <laughs> <laughs> kersha um do you think you can tell us at the point of your infancy when you were developing your art style when mm-hmm. did you realize that surrealism and an uh, abstract style of art was your calling was there a particular Uh, artist or was there like a piece of work that you saw that did it i know you mentioned akira but was there anything else that kind of pushed you in that direction um an artist i could think about off right off the bat because i'm horrible with names um it's francis bacon when i saw his the way that he really played with form and figure i felt like my work was validated in a sense because Um, I think in the beginning, I struggled with color theory and I struggled with proportion and all that stuff. So when I wasn't able to get to um, kind of like this realism and this realistic depiction of the human being, I kind of reverted a little bit and kind of took a segue, a detour, if you may, into um, abstraction of the figure because I was just like, well, I'm not really good at realism. Let me just go the total opposite end. So I think it really started in university when I was like, I was struggling in painting. Like I wasn't good when I first started and my marks will reflect that. Um, I was not good because I I was just really stubborn because I wanted to paint a a certain way. I wanted to use really bright and punchy colors, which, you know, does not equate to realism at all. Um, And some, you know, professors hated it. They didn't like the way that I approached the figure and other professors embraced that. They said that that's what makes, that's what makes you unique, right? So I just decided to go with that and kind of, you know, go with that abstracted way of representation because not many artists do, especially at that time, it was mostly like, I'm going to paint realistically, or that's what a lot of people wanted to strive for. So I just thought, why not do something different? Um, and also do something that makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, But right now I'm trying to study the human figure a little bit more and seeing if I could uh, possibly try to paint realistically just to challenge myself while I'm here, like while I'm in lockdown, let me see if I can try it at least. So um, I've kind of taken a step back a little bit just to see if I I can actually paint in a traditional classical way. And how do you find that so far for you? Is it kind of like relearning how to uh, do a skill? Yeah, it's frustrating because it's like, oh, I call myself a painter, but I actually cannot paint a certain way. And it's like, I actually like it because I like to be challenged and I like to, like no one's the the best at anything, even like the best, quote unquote, best painter is not the best, right? There's stuff that they struggle with. Um, I think it's really important for me to see where I do struggle and really improve on that because I just want to see the the progress from day one when I started practicing this way till the very last day. I like the challenge, to be honest. I see. Uh, so I want to bring up OCAD a little bit. Mm-hmm. When you applied to and got into post-secondary school for the arts, did you did you think you would have a certain experience that you didn't actually end up having? And do you think now that you've, you know, you're out of school, you've had a career and lifestyle in the arts. Do you think that even if you didn't go to post-secondary to figure out art, that you still would have ended up where you are today? 
That's a big question. I think about this all the time because I'm like, would I be where I am if I didn't go to post-secondary? Um, I think OCAD helped me learn, uh, aside from you know, skill-based learning, it helped me figure out a lot of things that I was lacking socially. So I was pushed in a lot of directions, um, especially in terms of uh, like different communities that existed at OCAD, for instance, the Black Futures Month uh, art show that happened every year. I was pushed into, you know, participating every year by a friend, Quinton, who I did a mural with when I was like 16 or 17. And he was, you know, working there at the time and, and attending OCAD. And he would always push me into doing all these different things. And I was so shy. I'm like, I don't want to go. I don't want to, I don't want to do this. Like, what if my art's not good enough? But he really pushed me into, um, going to these shows and, you know, participating in them. And through doing so, I met like a ton of people who I later, you know, hooked up with again later afterwards and forming um, the BAU Collective. So there was a lot of like, it's almost like a, a giant puzzle. And at that time I was putting a few of those pieces together, um, but it took another, you know, two or three years for the puzzle to kind of become a little bit clearer to be a little bit more complete because there was a lot of stuff that I wasn't engaging in in school, uh, more so like activities outside of OCAD. So like going to shows, uh, attending artist talks, like I avoided all of that literally until I graduated because again, social anxiety and all that, all that stuff. Um, the shows I did attend when I was at OCAD were shows that I, were, I was a part of, like with the Black Futures Month show. Um, but even those, I was like terrified. But again, I like was able to, uh, I was able to form like a, a small group of, of of people that I I trusted and that I conversated with even after school was over. Um, but I think there was a lot that I learned, a lot more that I learned after I graduated. So it's tricky. Like I don't know if not going to school would have you know, if I would be in the same place, but I definitely know like a lot of the, you know, the teaching opportunities wouldn't be there if I didn't go to post-secondary. Um, so I currently teach at Durham College in Oshawa. Um, and, you know, of course, when you're looking at your resume, they want to see that, you know, you have experience in the arts, but you've also been educated. So if I didn't go to OCAD or George Brown, which I took a year did some arts foundation course, George Brown. If I didn't go there, then, you know, those opportunities wouldn't exist. I see. I see. Yeah. 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 It's, um, what you said is, um, it's interesting to hear your take on it, but I've also heard that from other artists that they, they have to kind of play ball. You know what I mean? Like they, they have to go to school. Uh, mm -hmm. even with me, like, I, I, even though I'm doing more or less what I, what I thought I would do or what I would like to do in life, I didn't go to school right away after high school because I, I figured, like, do I really need to go to post-secondary for this? And me personally, looking back, like, I appreciate that I went to school because it taught me a lot of those social skills that are useful now. But mm -hmm. I also do think that, um, like, I probably would have been in a, the same or a similar mold. But, um, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting to hear you say that about um, the whole school thing. But mm -hmm. you also mentioned collectives. Can you tell us yeah. about collectives that you're a part of, uh, what they bring to the community and what they bring to Toronto in general, and also what entails with being with other artists in a collaborative process? Yeah. Um, so the first and only collective, only, no, no, it's not the only collective I've been a part of, but the first collective I, I worked with was BAU, which was formed in 2017, I believe. Um, I'm no longer active with BAU, um, but when we first began, it was more so like uh, just a collective, like a group of artists who wanted to do shows together. And we saw there was underrepresentation um, in Toronto of Black artists outside of, you know, Black History Month Black artist show. So we wanted to change that dynamic and, you know, show um black art under a different lens on our terms um so yeah that was like i think that experience to be honest was what gave me the confidence to continue within like the fine arts realm because i didn't really see a space for myself in the arts before that 
I was kind of like, oh, this is just like a very hoity-toity thing. Like it's a very white space. It's not for me. Uh, it's a very male dominated space as well. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to be really adding to this conversation necessarily. But um, when I was with the collective, there was a space for us to speak about things that concerned us within you know, the world in general, but specifically the art world. So there was kind of like a, it was very therapeutic in that way. Like there was a space to air our grievances, but also a space to, you know, commune and get feedback from your peers, which was super important at the time because I didn't know what I was doing. I'm still like, I don't a hundred percent know what I'm doing ever, but at that time I was just like, I do not know. Like, am I going to continue art? Where am I going? Like, I don't know where I'm going to show. Like, I, I didn't know anything about anything really. And I learned so much from them. So I'm forever grateful for the BAU and that collective um, because it really helped me get me back on my feet and give me that confidence, like keep going with my art. So, and, and that's wonderful to hear, by the way. I, it's just nice to hear that, especially like being a person of color obviously and mm -hmm. um just seeing how far we've come yeah mm -hmm. especially when it comes to working with each other getting our voices heard uh dealing with and moving past trauma and um I i'll come to that that's something i definitely want to come back to but um you're known for your murals and i i love your work i i love everything that you you do you're such a fantastic artist but obviously so many others feel the way uh feel the same way um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into the medium of creating murals and what murals you do up to today? Um, I started doing murals very young because it's funny because I recently thought about how I actually got into it. And I think I forgot for a while, but I was having troubles at school and high school. And I think it was related to social interaction. Again, I was like very shy, whatever. So my art teacher suggested that I see the guidance counselor and the guidance counselor had this, um, the sheet pinned to his uh, bulletin board, which was asking youth to participate in a mural project with mural roots. So I was like, oh, okay, that's pretty cool. And I signed up and I didn't expect to get it, but I got into it. I was 15 or no, I was 16, not 15. I was 16. Um, and that was the first mural project I ever participated in. Um, and I was working with four other youth artists. We were all around the same age. We did a mural in Brimley and Eglinton, and it was a temporary mural. So it was done on like MDF board and put up uh, the building that it was put up on, unfortunately got demolished. So it was the murals were moved like across Scarborough. I think, I think they're on Warden somewhere now. I forgot exactly where. Um, but that was my first experience doing a mural project. And that was my first job. So I'm like, wow, I can get paid and I can, you know, hang out with other artists <laughs> and paint a mural. Like at that age, I was just like blown away by the potential of this thing. And street art and mural art at that time wasn't really that big. This was back in 2008. Um, so it wasn't something that was really funded or pushed necessarily by the city as it is now. Um, so after that, I, you know, continued to do mural projects with, um, community-based organizations such as Mural Roots, Art Starts, um, Center 55 and Harborfront Community Center. So I did that for a couple of years and I was still very young. So I was considered a youth artist, um, so I did that until 2000 and 2017, so community-based murals. And then 2018, I started doing murals independently. Um, and my first opportunity with, was with this organization called Women's Paint, run by Barricat, who is a, a great mural painter who paints in uh, Toronto, but also she's done some murals internationally as well. So she uh, allows an opportunity for women to um, paint uh, women and non-binary people to paint. Um, and she created that organization because there was a, 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 not a small, but, you know, a, a lack of women painters in 
street art and in Toronto. So she felt the need to create this, uh, this uh, organization and this, this event for women painters, which was amazing because it was my first opportunity to showcase what I could do. I was super nervous. Like I remember the first day on site, I kept like, like painting small areas at a time because I didn't want to mess up. Uh, like when I first started drawing my design on the garage, I used a pastel. Like I was just so uncomfortable with painting that way without a supervisor that it like took me super long to do. Now I'm used to like the whole operation of things, but yeah, that was my first opportunity. And since then I've been painting around Toronto most. Yeah, it's only been kind of like the downtown core that I've been painting. Incredible. So you're teaching art now and you're passing mm -hmm. along your, your knowledge and your experiences to others. Is there anything about the method of your teaching that you bring to your students that may differ from how you were educated? For sure. So I always tell my students how it is. Like I try to be as realistic as possible when I approach um, kind of the real world aspects of the arts, like what will happen after you, ha happen after you graduate, um, kind of like who to talk to, what to avoid. So I try to give them that real world experience as someone who's gone through it, you know, firsthand kind of, yeah. So I'll speak to them in the same way that I'm speaking to you, kind of talking about, you know, what I did after uh, university and college, how it wasn't really smooth, smooth sailing, how a lot of what the, what you need after you graduate is those social connections and that ability to be social. That's like the utmost importance, actually, like being a great painter is, you know, great, but you also need to know how to talk to people and how to, uh, how to basically sell yourself as an artist to other people. Do you think that um, teaching the realities of like what it takes to get into the art world and like what challenges you may face, like, is that something that someone has to be taught or like you can tell them, but they really won't understand it until they actually experience it for themselves? Yeah, um, I think it's one of those things that you can talk about, but you never really understand until you're in it. But it's always good to be prepared for that. I know that like coming up, people would say things like your your demo's going to get rejected a hundred times and you're, you're going to get turned down by this person you're going to have doors shut in your face and we all hear that but it's not mm -hmm. until like you actually go through it a hundred times it, it does start to chip away at you and it does start to affect you a little bit but uh, yeah. I feel like especially as an artist because like you can tell when somebody is talented but just for whatever reason, the stars don't align. So maybe there's an opportunity that won't come to them or or for some reason they are not able to overcome certain hurdles. And that's unfortunate because, it, like at least for me, it does affect me and my ego. It does affect my inspiration a little bit. But um, I also feel that, like as you said, we're now creating more communities and more groups that are giving voices to those that maybe they were unfairly being closed off from the, the world of art. Um, how do you think the art community has changed uh, since you started until today? And do you think it's going to continue to change in a positive direction post-COVID? Um, what you mentioned there about rejection is super important. Like, I, I cannot tell you how many mural projects, especially those bell box mural projects, I submitted to coming up and got rejected for. Only recently did they invite me on. Um, but also like art shows, open calls that you get rejected from grants because grants could like, take a lot of writing. So you're there like slaving at your computer and then you submit this thing that doesn't get, you know, accepted. It really does hurt. So you have to like really love what you're doing to continue because I can see how it can bruise your ego so much so that you want to quit. But if you really love this thing, like it's something that you will just push forward and do. Um, I think with COVID, it will change the, the sphere of the art world a lot. And I think in one way that it can change and change and hope it will change and continue to do is the way that a lot of shows have been able to adapt to COVID just shows you how these spaces could be more accessible to people who cannot travel to, you know, say a gallery or 
um, say like a music festival, et cetera, et cetera. Like they've shown us that you can do these artist talks via a Facebook live. You can um, have, uh, you know, captions for your, you know, Instagram lives or your, you know, your Twitch streams or what have you. So I think it's showing us that the art world is a little bit more accessible than it was, right? Or than it, and then it was presented to be. Like the technology was always there, but now I think it will provide an opportunity for people who are not physically able to go to these spaces to attend these shows and people who felt kind of socially, you know, barred out of these spaces to attend perhaps virtually um, or in like different ways, right? So I've been seeing art shows, certain galleries uh, do these VR gallery spaces where you can actually like walk around the gallery um, using either a VR headset or just your, your phone, any sort of interface to just walk around and interact with the art pieces as you would if you were physically in the space, which is something that I think a few people experimented with before, but it wasn't really taken that seriously. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think it will change like the way we see art after all this, you know, craziness is over with. <laughs> And I'm looking forward to that. I honestly can't wait to, um, to to see what the world has in store for like continuing art. Like we've seen music develop so much. We're seeing new genres come out. We've seen comedians adapt, and we're we're seeing kids who thought they never had a voice really embracing the internet. So I mm-hmm. I am really looking forward to what changes we have. Yeah, and the the way people have been able to collaborate online is so wicked to me. Um, I downloaded TikTok, you know, I've been using TikTok. I feel like it's not for my generation. Not at like, all. <laughs> <laughs> it's for the Gen Zers. I think that's what they're called. And there are musicians who, I think it's called stitching, where you can play, you can play a melody of like on your guitar or whatever. And then somebody can stitch that with them singing. Another person can like stitch themselves doing like a saxophone. Uh, I don't know music terms, but you see what I mean? Like there's, they're collaborating in ways that people necessarily weren't doing it before, but I think there's such an opportunity and potential for that. So say you stitch with somebody who lives in Venezuela and you collaborated with like some drums and a flute or whatever. And then you have the opportunity after COVID to travel to Venezuela. Now you have a connection. You can play with them in a show you know, say you did like a digital commission um, with somebody who lives in Japan. So next time you go to Japan, you have like a connection that you can kind of link up with when you go there potentially. So I think it's really like the world is already, the world already feels really shrunken with, you know, our technological advancements. It makes the world much smaller, but I think this exper- experience with everybody being in lockdown has like made the world like that much smaller and that much connected which is pretty cool scary in a way but like cool in like the potential of collaboration i i fully agree it is it is frightening but it's yeah. also <laughs> it's pretty amazing that's true uh i have a couple more questions for you what does toronto mean to you uh toronto Toronto versus everybody. I don't know. Uh, Toronto means. Uh, how does Toronto mean to me? Toronto is. It was home for a long time, specifically, you know, the, the downtown core. I was living in Chinatown for a bit. I had some great experiences living there, but also some bad ones because when you're living in the city, there's some creepy people that wander around. <laughs> I have a few stories, I don't know if I can say them on here, but like, it's wild. But I learned so much living down there and on my own. Um, Toronto is just like, a, I think the potential here is like super, super large. Like the creativity that's in Toronto, not only in the core, but in the GTA. Like there are so many talented people that live, you know, outside of the city, but a lot of the focus tends to be on Toronto. like. The, city, like the downtown core most of the time, but there are so many people who are making great work outside of that. Um, and I think a lot of um, 
I think the art world should expand outside of the the, the inner like the inner city of Toronto. I think it should be like you know Scarborough focused. Like sometimes like maybe open up a gallery in, in Scarborough or a a studio a music studio in Scarborough so that more people have access to these things. Like everything is so centralized to the city that it makes it feel like <clears throat> makes you feel like you can't do anything if you don't live there. So I think, you know, Toronto is great. Like I love the creativity that we have here, but I think like there's so much potential in the GTA that I think a lot, a lot of the times people should focus on people outside. If that makes sense. It does. It does. Um, yeah. For anyone listening to this, Scarborough, Hamilton, Markham, Stouffville, Burlington, you can even go further and further up. You have Barry. you have all these other cities. There's so many great creatives. And mm-hmm. um, I, I truly feel that Toronto is one of the greatest cities in the world because we have so many d- different people, different cultures and different upbringings and lifestyles that when we come together for a, a common interest, you, you get like a real melting pot of all of those different different influences and I, I just like you I feel like there's so much potential that maybe isn't being recognized now but mm-hmm. there are many that they're aware and I'm hoping that we're pushing into the direction of not just opening up our, our borders to people all over the world but also within our communities I, I think there needs to be more uh, community outreach and growth and just collaboration because there's there's no reason why people should think that there are like certain stigmas towards Scarborough that overshadows the, uh, the the richness of the city and there's no reason why mm-hmm. even though there is a lot of creepiness in downtown uh the, trust me I, I used to i used to work in chinatown so i i know and there's been many times i'm stumbling from the club and like i, I it's like you know craziness but at the same time that's just those are incidences but like there are also like moments there are moments that exist and i'm hoping that there's more of them that more people can realize yeah and i don't want to I don't want to mark Chinatown with that one ex- or those experiences I had as specifically Chinatown. It's just like a city thing. Like people just approach you weird. They, I don't know. It's a city thing. It's not specific to a, a, an area at all. <laughs> oh, no, no. We feel you. We feel you. And anyone who's, uh, they, they, they know. They know. Yeah. But yeah, I, I love the city. You know, I sometimes have my grievances with it, but generally I love it. What challenges have you encountered as a black woman and a creative? Uh, I'm sure there's been hurdles that you've had to overcome or hurdles that maybe are still hard for you to get over. But Mm -hmm. from everything that you've gone through and you're currently going through and what you expect to go through, is there anything in particular that you would like to bring to light or any experiences that has helped you grow? And is any of that something that you could pass on to future artists? Yeah, I think the the main one is people, this goes as something as, you know, as a Black woman, but also as just like a woman, like people just do not take you serious, seriously, especially as somebody who is, you know, comical to my own fault. Like people just do not take you seriously. Like you have to literally show them a Pulitzer Prize and a Grammy and an Emmy all in one package for them to be like, okay, you're legit. You you know what you're doing, right? So I've worked really hard to get where I am right now. And I think sometimes like I never feel like it is like good enough because it's just like the way I've been conditioned. Kind of like nothing you really do is good enough until you're at the very top, wherever that is, type of way of seeing the world, Um, which is very crooked, right? Like you should always be appreciative wherever you are, which I am, but I am always like, oh, I can do better. Like I can always like achieve this, achieve this 10 times more or what what have you. So I think a lot of the times it's, that just comes from people just not taking you seriously from, from early on. This happens not, you know, as just an adult, but as like a child as well, where they, especially for black, young black girls, where they, um, they don't treat you as a child. They treat you as a, an adult right which is like you have all these responsibilities on on to you or they treat you like um you should know better at such a young age and then when you get older it's like you you're you're super strong you should you should have all of these accolades like you're never really treated how you should be treated at the time if that makes sense um so yeah i just feel like 
those challenges are really specific to the age as well. And I feel like there's like a challenge at each time in your life, or at least for me, there's always been like some sort of hurdle that I've had to smash. <laughs> <laughs> I'm grateful I, I met you because even hearing you say that, it's something that like I, I feel I, I have five sisters. So I, I've seen firsthand how like like this just the pure shit they have to put up with in in their fields. So I my mother, my grandmother, and my auntie like they were very active in raising me, and like I've seen all of the the crap that they had to put up with. But they're strong women, and even though they were super strong, I, I had people tell them that they weren't strong enough. But mm -hmm. it's just it's that's the entire thing that you're saying. It comes to a point where it's like, when is good enough? Good enough. The yeah, one it's like. So what do you need? Like, what do you, what more do you want to me? For, want from me? Like, I just, sometimes it's too much. And I just like, I peace out for a bit. Cause I'm like, I don't know, especially when you are teaching as well. Like it's another kind of role that you take on. You feel like you have to be the best of whatever that already exists out there. And then you end up like burning yourself out. And I do that so often. Cause I'm like, it just has to be, it has to be the best. It has to be really good. But yeah, totally five. And you have five sisters. Yep, I'm the middle child. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I only have brothers, so I can't, <laughs> <laughs> I can't relate. Three brothers. I've always wanted a sister, though. That'd be awesome. Let's switch. Uh, I'll trade you two sisters for a brother. Okay, sure. You can Sounds have, good. <laughs> you can have the youngest one. There you go. I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> Kershaw. Yeah. Honestly, um, this was a great interview. It was awesome to get caught up with you. And um, I, it's, it's just amazing uh, to always hear about uh, a successful and a talented black woman. Just tell her story. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot that people can take away from this. Is there anything that you would like to plug or anything you're reading or artists that you're into that you'd like to share with us? Um... Oh my gosh, there is a list of artists that I love and that I recently have been just obsessing over their work. But again, I have issue with um, names. I don't know what it's what it is, but I can't remember their names. Uh, but I've been looking at a lot of art. If there's an opportunity where I can send you links and link them down below wherever that I could do that for you. Links will um, be provided in the description below. Yes, because <laughs> there are a lot of awesome artists that I, I've been looking at recently. Um, I have a show next month. It's a virtual show. There, there isn't any, um, there hasn't been any uh, postings about it yet, yet, but it will be with Dead Projects. So you can follow their Instagram and see any updates on that. Um, and yeah, you can look out for me in the summer and spring, I'll be doing murals. But, oh, there's a Black History Month show, sorry, um, with, uh, the Run Gallery. Um, I'm not too sure where they're located. They're by Runny Meat Station. I'm sorry, but <laughs> the Run Gallery. It's okay. There'll be there'll be information listed. Okay, so the Run Gallery uh, Black History Month show. There should be a soft launch happening tomorrow, but you can also follow their Instagram to keep updated. Um, and yeah, they're a new gallery. Please check them out and stop by if you can. They're awesome. Yeah, that's it. Thank you so much, Kersha. You are an incredible person, and I can fanboy over you all day, but I think um, <laughs> instead you guys can check out her social media. I uh, will provide links and uh, check out all the shows that she mentioned, and please feel free to share this interview with any artist that you know, any people of color that you know, and of course, just remember, if you're creative yourself, it's always important to just keep going. It's it's hard. It's very hard, and I don't think it ever gets easier. I, I think you just learn to deal with it better. But uh, mm -hmm. as you can see with what Kersha has accomplished and what she, um, what she aspires to do, keep at it because it's worth it. It really is the payoff. Let me tell you, it's good. When it's good, it's good. When it's bad, it's meh. But when it's good, it's good. So long as you're creating, right? <laughs> yeah. Kersha, yeah. thank you so much for taking the time and uh, take care of yourself. No problem. Bye. Thanks for having me. Take care, everyone. Thank you.